All right, everybody, it is that time. Let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the gifts that you have given us in your divine service. Bless us as we come together to study your word, that uh, by your word through, uh, through James, that you would strengthen our faith. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> there, there have been a couple times in, in past Bible classes where it, that you'll see the video and it'll just like tilt for a second or two. That's why. <laughs> All right, so any questions this morning? Right. Well, yeah, when, when Paul talks about I'm making up for something, yeah, he's not talking about works righteousness, salvation. It's not like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I have to do, you know, this chunk of, of my salvation. I have to put in my time. Um, his, his teaching very clearly shows that. If you, you know, instead, don't just take that one passage, which, you know, is always the temptation to do. Take one passage out of context and away from every other teaching in Scripture and say, oh, well, see, you know, this is what, this is what it's saying. But we have to look at the, the whole context. And so Paul very clearly teaches, no, you're saved by grace through faith not by works. So when he says, you know, I'm, you know, making up for something, that's, that's not at all what he's saying. Um, what, what he's probably talking about, um, and, and he mentions this um, often, is, you know, he, you know where, where did Paul come from? You know, like, what, what's, what's his history? He, his history is he, he was a persecutor of the church. Uh, I mean, he, and we don't get a number or, or a count of, of how many Christians he arrested or, or you know, caused to be arrested or, or even murdered. Um, but but he, he caused harm to the church. You know, he, he arrested people. Um, and and he, I mean, this is why people were afraid of him for so long and, and didn't acknowledge him as a, an apostle for quite some time. Uh, because, you know, he had done all of this harm against the church and hated the church. And then all of a sudden, you know, he, he goes on this trip to Damascus. You know, there's a flip of the switch. Christ converts him on that road. He's baptized. And now he is out proclaiming the word of God. And everybody else is just kind of sitting there saying, ah, I don't know. You know, he, he, even, yeah, well, even when, when God tells... Um, Ananias, um, you know, you are to go and, and baptize Saul uh, because, you know, I've made him my servant. And he's saying, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, God, uh, because have you seen what he's done? Uh, and he says, no, like, I will do this. And, and, G and God even says at that point, you know, he, he will, to paraphrase poorly, you know, he, he will make up for what he's done. Right. He, he will he will go through much suffering, you know, a, a lot more suffering than than others have uh, for my name. Be, because he has done so much work in slandering my name, he will now face trials because of my name. And so um, often, yeah, people will take that kind of idea that Paul's getting at that, you know, I'm, I'm making up, you know, f for these things is that, you know, the, the first part of his life, he hated the church and he was, was striving against it. And, and so now he's, you know, in a sense, making up for lost time. And so I'm, I'm doing these good works to, to try and build the kingdom where I thought I was trying to destroy the kingdom before. Um, and so I, I would say that that's where Paul is, is getting at. It's not works righteousness, but saying, you know, I've, and this is why Paul says, you know, I'm, I'm chief of sinners. I, you know, I'm the worst because I've, I've done all of these things. Uh, and so he, 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 in, in his mind, he is making up for 
uh, all of these these bad things that he has done in the past. So that I, I think that that's where where he's going for what he's going for. Yeah, Frank. I think a lot of this stuff even still goes on for praying about what Paul has done, even in our days and time. That these people cutting the churches down and uh, destroying a lot of stuff, and then they're trying to bring them back in. It is even hurting worse than what it was before. Yeah, well, there's plenty of people who are at work trying to destroy the church, and of course, Satan is using those people to try and and destroy the church. Um, but, and we we kind of talked about this last week. Where, you know, Saul, you know, he hates the church. Uh, he is named as one of the people there at the stoning of Stephen. You know, he, it says that, you know, Luke records that, yeah, he was, he was holding people's coats so that they could, you know, get better throws in at, at Stephen. And, and he hates the church. Stephen is martyred. And, and from there, that's when the persecution in Jerusalem really ramps up. Um, and, you know, so Saul thinks he's doing this great work in, in destroying the church by, you know, by murdering Stephen and, and starting this persecution. But because of that persecution, all the Christians kind of scattered, you know, to, to get away from this persecution. And because of their scattering, the dispersion that James talks about, now the gospel is being spread to all of these different regions that these Christians are running to. So even, you know, God even uses the persecutors of the church to then grow the church. And th this is why we see, you know, the church grows most during times of persecution. You know, the early church was, was heavily persecuted, and yet it was exploding through the, the first couple centuries. Be because, I mean, people saw that it was real and 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 there, it, it grew during that time of persecution. If you look at places in Africa, if you look in China, you know, these areas where there is much more persecution than here, the, the, the Christian church is exploding. I mean, millions and millions of Christians are, 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 are well, people are becoming Christians and, and believing. Whereas you look at, you know, times in, in the church's history where there hasn't been that persecution, it's been kind of stagnant, if not decline. I mean, look, look at Europe today. You know, Europe was, you know, we think of, you know, Roman Catholic Church throughout years. We think of the Reformation. I mean, society itself was a religious society. The, the Pope was not just a, you know, a church leader, but a political leader as well. It was, I mean, Christianity was everywhere. And yet now we look at Europe and it is so secular that it's, it's hard to find an actual true church over there. Um, America is becoming like that. We, we've had so much time of, you know, religious freedom, and you're not per really persecuted for your faith. And what has happened? The church is kind of, has declined, not kind of, very much has. Uh, and so it, it's very interesting to look at in those times of, of peace and, you know, the lack of persecution, uh, we kind of take the faith for granted and the church kind of declines. But when persecution ramps up, the church thrives. And, you know, it, it boggles our mind. It doesn't logically make sense to us and how that works, but that just shows how God is the one at work creating faith, that in these times of hardship, God grows the church. And so, yes, there will always be, as Christ said, there will always be false teachers, people trying to work and destroy the church, uh, but we know that God works even in those moments uh, to, to grow the church and keep the church together. The church will never fall. Um, now, Holy Cross may one day, you know, not exist, but, but the, the true universal church, the Catholic church in the proper sense, not Roman Catholic, but uh, the Catholic universal Christian church, uh, will always stand. That It will never be destroyed, even when we may think that that is the case. You know, think Elijah when, he, when he's running for his life and he says, you know, God, just kill me. I'm the only one left and I'm, I'm just tired. And God says, no, no, you're not alone. There are 7,000 others who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You know, go, go and, you know, find Elisha, you know, continue the work of the church. So the church will always stand uh, even when others work to try and destroy it. Any other questions this morning? All right, if you think of something, just raise your hand and I'll try and get to you. All right, so let's see. We left off 
the book of James. I think we got through verse 4, if I remember correctly. Um, so we, we leave off, uh, we start with verse 5. So if someone could read James verses 5 through 8. All right, so, so he starts off you know, here saying, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously and, with, and to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Um, now, this, the, a study of, of the word wisdom and how it's used is, is a really interesting study. Um, when we think of wisdom, you know, we, we typically think of, you know, of course, someone who is wise, someone who, you know, knows a lot and, and is able to, you know, navigate life well. Um, so, you know, some, there, the, there's the wise and, and the fool. The fool, you know, doesn't make good decisions and, and says things he's not supposed to. And um, th- this, this is the, the fool. Um, but the, the wise person knows exactly what to say, know, knows how to act. Um, th- this is the, the wise man. Uh, but in the, in the scriptures, it, it takes that, that idea of wisdom and ex- expounds on it. Uh, the, the one who is wise is the one who has faith. Um, this is what we see in the, in the parable of the, the ten virgins. There's the five wise virgins and the, and the five foolish virgins. Uh, the, the five wise virgins uh, are the ones who have faith. You know, the, the parable, of course, says, well, they were wise because they had oil, uh, or they brought extra oil, and the, the five foolish are the ones who, who didn't plan ahead. Uh, but Jesus is getting at something more than just, you know, those who are smart and those who aren't. Uh, but that oil represents faith uh, in, in that parable. And so the five wise virgins are those who have faith, and the, the five foolish are the ones who, who don't have faith. And so then on the last day when the bridegroom returns, they're, they're sc- you know, scrambling to try and you know, go to those people who you know, they have to go and, and get faith for themselves. Uh, and so they go and try and you know, go to the people who do give faith, go to the church and the pastors. But at that time, it's, it's too late. On the last day, when the trumpet sounds, um, it's going to be too late to run to church and say, Oh, pastor, I actually do believe. Um, that's, it, this, so, that, that's right. That's why it baptized me. And it's like, well, you have to go through instruction. And so it's a 10-week process. So do you have time? Because, yeah, it will be too late for that. Um, and, and so the, the five wise are those who, who have faith. They, they, they've been going to receive that oil of faith regularly from their pastor, from the church. And so when the time comes, when Christ does return, then they are prepared. Um, and so, so, you know, wisdom often in the scriptures is, is equated with faith. Uh, and so when, when James here, you know, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom... Uh, let him ask God who gives generously um, that, you know, if any of you lacks faith, oftentimes you can, it, it, it can be helpful to just substitute that term wisdom for faith. Uh, so if any of you lacks faith, uh, ask God and he will give it to you. Um, and, and so, and, and from that faith then flows, you know, Christian wisdom, right? How, how we as Christians to, are to live. Um, Dr. Giese in his commentary talks about how wisdom, when, when you have wisdom, you, you are true wisdom. You are seeing things from God's perspective. So, you know, you can look at things that, you know, look at the church and, and see, well, it's just a bunch of people gathering together. Uh, whenever a baptism happens, the pastor just speaks some words. It's some ritual. They pour some water on a kid. Uh, when they, they go up for communion, they, you know, they're, they're bowing for no reason, you know, to, looks like they're bowing to the pastor. That's kind of weird. Uh, and then, you know, they receive this, this little piece of supposedly bread, 
uh, that you know, and, and a little bit of wine, and that's all. And they sing some songs, and 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 that's it. Um, you know, that that's what it looks like from from the outside. But we who have faith, we we see what's happening, right? And we, and we don't even see the the true reality of what's happening. Um, but but we know what's going on. We have faith in what is happening. Baptism, uh, where the the old Adam in that child is, is drowned, and they are given new life. Um, you know, I, I've heard it described as, you know, if if we could see truly see what the the spiritual things that are happening, kind of you know the spiritual realm um, in the divine service, it would just blow our minds. But but we can't we can't always see that. Uh, and the, the story I go to in explaining that is, um, I forget the exact passage, but Elisha, um, he, he's been, you know, giving advice to uh, the Israelite king. And, um, and so they're, you know, able to defeat the enemies, you know, whatever way the enemy goes, the, the armies of Israel are always there to, to cut them off. And so the enemy decides to go, they, he gets word that Elisha is the one giving the the commands, giving away their movements. And so he sends his army in the middle of the night to go and surround Elisha in this village that he's at. And so they wake up in the morning, Elisha's servant goes outside and freaks out because this big army is surrounding their small village and the armies of Israel are not there to protect them. And so he runs to Elisha and is freaking out, says, Elisha, we're going to die. There's, you know, this is a horrible situation. And Elisha is just calm as ever. He's just sitting there, you know, drinking his tea in the morning. And, 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 and he says, God opens his eyes. And, and, and God opens his eyes, and, and the servant then sees that the heavenly host is, is surrounding the village, between, you know, between the armies and Elisha. And so Elisha sees that the, the angels are, are there protecting them, which is why he's not worried. Um, but the servant couldn't see that. He couldn't see the, that spiritual reality that's there. And, and I think the same, you know, because of our fallen nature. Um, but, and I think the same thing happens in the divine service, right? We, we walk in and we don't see a lot of this stuff that is happening. Um, but in baptism, you know, if we saw what was really happening, it would be, you know, you carrying this dead corpse up to the font. And when, when the pastor speaks and when the water is applied, that corpse is given life, you know, takes breath and, and is now a living person in Christ. You know, that, that is what is happening in baptism. Uh, same thing, you know, when we get into, into the Lord's Supper, you know, we, you know, we sing, you know, I see, yeah, right before the Sanctus, you know, we say, you know, with angels and archangels and with all the, the host of heaven, that we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, and then we sing the Sanctus, uh, which is the song of the angels and the heavenly host in Revelation. And so, you know, it looks like we're just a congregation that's, that's singing there. But in reality, all of the heavenly hosts are with us singing praise to God. When we come to receive the Lord's Supper, we are, we are dining with all of the saints. That that is the reality of the Lord's Supper. And, but we don't see that reality yet. Uh, but it is a reality. And it's because of our, our fallen nature. And so, um, so, so we, we, I don't even know how I got on this. Um, oh, yes. See, see, yes. Seeing things from God's perspective. It's helpful to have notes. Um, and so, but, but this, is, this is how God sees what's happening in the church. And so we as faith, with those with faith, can, can see these things and believe these things. And when we don't see these things, but when God tells us these things are happening, we, we believe and have faith. And so oftentimes the things that, you know, God considers wise right? The, the world considers foolishness. Um, going to church, believing in a God that you can't see, uh, you know, uh, being humble, looking after others above yourself, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the things that we are taught in scripture are contrary to the world, and you're going to hear that in my preaching a lot. Um, you probably already have. Um, but, th but this is what wisdom is. It's that faith given to us that we are then able to live a Christian life in that Christian wisdom. And so, 
When we lack faith, when we lack wisdom, we ask God. We come to church and, and ask that we would receive these things, and God graciously gives us uh, that faith. He gives us word and sacrament. He gives us the, the scriptures to read at home. Uh, we can pray to him anytime. Um, God is so generous in, in what he gives. Uh, he, he is not stodgy. He is not, you know, I'm just going to give you a little bit or just enough so that you make it through to heaven, right? He, he abundantly pours out. Um, this, is, this is what I, one part of why I love the, the liturgy and the divine service, because it shows that abundance, that generosity clear on display. You are forgiven of your sins. I don't know how many times during the divine service. You know, a lot of people would think, okay, well, you come in, you confess your sins, and you receive forgiveness. Okay, cool, let's head home. I got forgiveness. Uh, but no, you, you continue to hear the word, you receive the forgiveness uh, that you hear in the words, you then, you know, confess the creed and the Lord's prayer, the Lord's supper gives you forgiveness. Uh, you know, you're just constantly bombarded with the word of God and his promises and forgiveness. And, and so you, you really, you know, if, if we were truly able to take everything in the divine service and the liturgy to heart, we would leave with no doubt in our mind that we are forgiven because of Christ for us. And that's without the sermon. That this is just the, the liturgy, the hymns, and, and you know, all of the, the teaching that's there, uh, which is why the liturgy is so great, because even if the pastor preaches a bad sermon, you still have the liturgy to, to tell you about Christ. Um, so... Yes, <laughs> the liturgy does protect you from bad pastors. That's right. Yeah. Oh well, thank you. Well, yeah, and and I can take a, a minute or two to explain why I do some of the stuff that I do, because you know sometimes it just seems like pastors do things for you know their personal preference or you know whatever. Um, you know, why, why do I chant? That's, that's, you know, a question that often is asked. I, I don't chant just because I'm good at singing and I, I like, I like to hear the sound of my own voice. Uh, that, that is not why I chant. Uh, I chant because that is what we see in Revelation. Whenever the, the worship that happens in Revelation, everything is sung. The, the angels are constantly singing the praises of God. And so, so I take that because our worship is that worship that's happening in Revelation. And so I chant because that is what the heavenly host is doing. And so I, I, I chant and try and reflect that worship in, in our divine service. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's why I chant. You know, in, in the service of the sacrament, you know, why, why do I, you know, elevate the elements and, and then, you know, genuflect, bow before, before them? Well, it's because uh, that is Christ. It, it is to honor Christ and to show reverence to my Lord, who is there in my hands. Um, this, this is why, uh, also, just a, a side note, when, you know, often you'll see me, you know, when I come up, you know, there's kind of two areas to the, the chancel area. There's the, where the pulpit and the lectern are, and then there's the altar. And, and I always bow before going in and out of those areas, because that's where the word of God is preached and read, and this is where the Lord's Supper is administrated. You know, this is where God is present. Uh, but when I am bringing the Lord's Supper down to someone in the pew, I don't bow at those areas, um, which, you know, why, why don't I do that? Well, it's because I have God right there in my hands. And so I don't need to turn and bow to him when he's at the altar. He's right there in my hands. So I, you know, he's, he's there in front of me, which is why I always try and, and hold, hold the things up in a, in a higher way, um, because it is Christ there physically. So it, it, it is a confession of, of what is happening, what it is, and, and it's reverence to try and, you know, to say that this is my Lord and I am unworthy to be here. Um, and so, you know, so this is why I do the things I do. Um, it, it's, it's, it's for a purpose. 
uh, to try and be reverent and, and to confess what, what actually is happening in the divine service. Um, and so, so yeah, so if you ever have questions about why I'm bowing here and there, making the sign of the cross here and there, um, feel, feel free to ask and, and I can explain those because um, it's not just a, oh, you're, you're a Roman Catholic in disguise. You know, this, this is, you know, this is, this is me trying to be reverent, but... Right. Well, and this, this is why Christ does the things he does and says the things he says. It's never just to, you know, for a display or, or to say, oh, look, look at me and look at these great things I'm, I'm giving you. Everything that he gives and does is to strengthen your faith. Uh, every single thing that happens in the divine service is to strengthen that faith. And this is, this is what God does. He constantly is lavishing us with these gifts so that we would be strengthened in our faith and may remain steadfast. Um, absolutely. All right, any other questions? So yeah, so we, we see that, that, that wisdom, that faith, that God lavishly gives us those things. Uh, we ask in faith with no doubting. That's a, that's a tough uh, thing to actually live out and do, which is why we always have to ask for, you know, th this, this verse all goes together. You know, let him ask in faith, you know, verse 6, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. You know, you're always just going back and forth, worrying about one thing and, and, and another. And this is inevitably going to happen because we're sinful people. So what should we do in that moment? Well, when, you're, when, you, are, when you are doubting in your asking God for things, it shows that you are lacking faith, lacking wisdom. So what are you to do? You're to ask God for more wisdom, for more faith. And, and this, this is, I mean, this is the Christian life throughout. You, you pray that God would give you faith. He, he gives you faith. You go. Your sinful nature then doubts, you know, the faith that God has given you and doubts his promises. And so we fall into sin and we see that sin. We repent of our sin and pray that God would forgive us and strengthen our faith. And he does so. And we just keep going until Christ returns. Um, absolutely. That is the, one of the greatest prayers. Uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And, and this is I mean, this is what we see, and oftentimes with, with people uh, that I've seen on their, on their deathbed before they're about to die, you know, they, they're questioning, do I have enough faith? Um, it's like, and, and I tell them, well, the, the fact that you're worried about it shows that you have faith. You know, the unbeliever doesn't worry about those things. And so, you know, you have faith, and so you pray that prayer. Lord, I, I believe, I believe that Jesus has died on the cross for me. Now, help me to actually believe it, <laughs> right? Um, and so, yeah, that is the constant prayer that, that we pray. Yeah, Frank. I think a lot of people that think about that, I feel all these scripture words that make people up and you also go, what would you do? You're, you're giving credit back to God or to Jesus and you're worshiping him and them and everything else and just saying, yes, I believe. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a confession of what I believe, what this church believes. And, and ab absolutely everything we do is a confession uh, of, of what we believe. And so that's why it's very important to, to look at how we worship, what we do, um, because everything we do teaches something. And we want those things to be teaching Christ crucified. So, uh, yeah, so, so we ask God for more faith. We, we, and we ask him in faith. Uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and then verse 7, you know, for, uh, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Um, he is double minded, a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Um, and so, you know, when, when we pray in faith, we know that the Lord is going to answer. Um, and and when, when you ask apart from faith, then, then that, the doubt comes in and you are unsure whether or not you know, God's actually going to do what, what he's saying. And, and so we're not to be like that person doubting, but we are to, to be the one of faith who, who, who asks in faith, trusts that God is going to answer. And even if he answers in, 
a way that we think is not proper. We, we say, yes, Lord, and, and accept what, what he has to give us. Um, because a lot of times, God answers our prayers in ways that we don't exactly want. Um, we, we think we know best, and, and God just kind of laughs at us and says, no, no, you don't know what's best for you. I know what's best for you. Um, even if it doesn't look like it's what's best for us. You know, even when we go through tests and, and hardships, um, God takes care of us. And he, he works good for those who love him. That passage is true. And so even when we go through hard times, uh, God is with us and working for our good. And so it's, it's hard to, but we have to trust in, in God that he is working for our good, um, our ultimate good. So any, any more questions on that little paragraph? That's right. That's right. Yes, his his plan is perfect. God can put nothing into plan that is not perfect, and and so yeah. So we we trust and and follow him. And um, you know, in in the Psalms of Lament, we we see the the psalmists basically saying, God, it doesn't look like you are being good. It doesn't look like you are holding true to your promises, uh, and so hold to them. <laughs> you know. Uh, be be faithful to me and and but they always end in faith you know the the psalms of lament they 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 are a little they make us uncomfortable at first because you know these they don't pull punches uh, against god you know but they call out god and say you know you are not keeping this promise and that promise you are not sticking with your people you've stuck with your people before but you're not doing it now where are you i thought you were good and, and we were like, whoa, like I, I would never think to pray in that way. But it's always important to look at the ends of those Psalms of Lament because they always end in faith and trust. They always say, God, I know you are faithful and I know you are going to provide for me. I know you're going to bring me out of this and, and into paradise, whether that's in this life or the next. Um, and, and they always end in that way. And in fact, it's in faith that you even ask these prayers and pray these these psalms of lament um so it, it's okay to be honest with god he can take it um but trust that he will keep his promises e even when it looks like he's not doing that at the at the present time uh, but what he does is perfect always all right if someone could read verses 9 through 11. let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and in the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. All right. So here, you know, we get this, um, this, this lesson in humility. Uh, you know, that the, the lowly brother is to boast in his exaltation, uh, which who is responsible for his exaltation? Christ. It's, it's not him, you know, working him, himself up to exalt himself, uh, but this is the work of God. And, re and let the rich uh, boast in his humiliation. Uh, we get this, this great exchange uh, that, that's always been counter to society. The, the rich are the ones who are in power. They are the ones who seem blessed by God. They are the ones who get to control everything. This has been the case, you know, throughout the entire history of man. And it's the poor who are always neglected. They are the lowly of society. They're not important. Um, some, you know, at points in history, it's even gone to the point of saying that they are not even human, even worth any value. Uh, but, but here we get this great exchange that, that the, the lowly brother, the poor, is exalted up and the, the rich is humbled. Um, and, and so we, we see this, this language here. Uh, of course, it should bring to mind the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, uh, where, where she praises God after, of course, Gabriel comes and, and tells her that she, uh, this, you know, this poor little virgin girl, is going to bear the Son of God. 
uh, that will bring salvation to all. And she, you know, she, you know, answers in faith and says, you know, let it be as you have said. And then she sings this song, the Magnificat, which is in parts of our liturgy. Um, and it's, it's this song making this point, praising God for exalting me, this lowly maiden, and bringing down the mighty. Uh, that this is, this is what God does. And to show that it is not our work, it's not our efforts that, that make us great, but it's God who exalts us. Uh, and so, um, so, so we see the ties there to the Magnificat, which I, I think is very purposeful. Uh, because remember who is, is writing this. It is James, the half-brother of Jesus, whose mother was Mary. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, there's that tie there um, that, you know, he wasn't alive at that point of the, the song, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if that... It also parallels Miriam's song in the Old Testament as well, so he would have known... Right, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, that song there, um, yeah. They, yeah, when you, when you compare, um, yeah, Mary's song and, um, um, oh, what's it, is it, is it Miriam or is it, um, uh, Samuel's mom? Hannah's Han, song Hannah's song is, yeah, because she was barren, right? She, she couldn't have any children and then, um, yeah, and then and then she is she is given <laughs> that story is so fun. I love that story because she's in the temple and she's you know praying you know out loud in her head and she's talking like she but she's not and then you know the priest comes and thinks she's drunk and tries to get her out of the temple. It's great. It's the, the it's these kind of things that make you know that the Bible's true because like if you're trying to write a serious like theological book, you don't put something like that in there. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but those, those songs, so yeah, so they would have known the song of Hannah, um, which, which is, I mean, almost identical to the Magnificat. Um, but yeah, it's, it's this song of, of that great reversal, that, that the lowly are exalted, the exalted are brought low. Um, and therefore, boast in God. Don't boast in the things of this world. Don't boast in the things that you can do. Boast in Christ. Um, and again, we, we see language that is, is connecting to the, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, it talks about that the sun rises and with it scorches its heat and withers the grass and the, the flower falls and its beauty perishes. You know, the, these things that, you know, are beautiful today, they, they pass away. So don't, don't build your, your treasure and your hope on these earthly things, but rather build your treasure in heaven, on the heavenly things. Um, boast in Christ. That's that's what he, is happening here. Uh, so, any questions on any of that? All right, we got a few more minutes. So let's go. If someone could read verses twelve through fifteen. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love Him. Let no one say. And desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. All right, so yeah, so verse 12 here, uh, you know, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Uh, for when he has stood the test, uh, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Um, this verse is, you know, again, here is another picture of the gospel found in James. Um, you know, he's, he's saying, you know, the one who remains steadfast, the one who perseveres, um, similar language to, to in Revelation where, where, you know, John is writing and Jesus is speaking to the church and saying, you know, to the one who conquers will, you know, be given the crown of life and, and many other gifts. Um, and that this is, this is what it means for Christians to, to conquer is, is simply to keep the faith. To remain steadfast. We know from Christ's teaching that the world is going to attack us and hate us and try and destroy the church, as we were talking about before. And so 
Our job is not to, you know, fight them and defeat the enemy and, you know, reign victorious uh, by our own actions and, and fighting. Uh, we are victorious. We conquer. We are given the crown of life when we remain steadfast, when we keep the faith. Um, it, this, it, in Revelation, it uses the language of, of the saints who have been martyred as, as those who have conquered. And it seems kind of opposite, right? That they, you know, they're standing there in the, you know, p- perhaps in the Colosseum or, or elsewhere, and, and they are, you know, killed before for others, you know. And it seems like Rome has, has conquered against them. They, they've squashed this rebellious.